because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. And good evening, church. Welcome once again to Wednesday Night Bible Study. So glad we can be together. I want to just say how much I appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, if you do have comments, please put them in the comment section. We'll talk about the questions you may have. But it's a great time for us to gather together and to look into God's Word. We've started our study of the book of Ephesians. Praise God, there are such deep truths here in this first chapter. It's just mind-boggling. Uh, we're not going to go fast. We're going to go slow. We're going to try to get as much out of this as we can because... Of course, our goal is to believe the truth and to submit ourselves to the Word of God. And because of that, we need to understand. So, Lord, help us, please. Uh, before we get to the verses tonight, though, I do want to spend just a moment for those of you that are watching that don't attend Living Hope. I've heard from several of you that you'd like to think about participating in this ministry. Um, the biggest way to participate in this ministry is just to pray, to ask for the Lord's wisdom guidance, discretion, direction for our leadership and for our people that we might submit to the Word of God and do what's right and that God might have His way with us. If you do want to donate, <coughs> excuse me, if you do want to donate financially, uh, there's a PayPal link below in the description. Also, there's a way to donate by mail if you want to use our P.O. box to send us a gift, a love offering. We'd love that as well, but uh, please don't feel obligated. I want you to understand that we do have this five-acre piece of, piece of property just to the east of the Colorado Anschutz Health Science Center. Uh, we're at 1671 Altura Boulevard, and just to the west of this huge complex. I'm sorry, to the east of this huge complex. I, I, I bring this to your attention one more time because what we really need to do is pray. Pray that God in His timing will build the worship center on this land for the glory of His name. There's quite a backstory to this land and how we received it and how God opened the right doors at the right time. And we're convinced that God will push us all the way through to affect this whole area of North Aurora as that worship center is established and people are faithful to what God has said. That's our goal. I pray that you continue to pray for us about that. Because we know God is able, don't we, church? Praise God for that. All right, well, we're going to begin our study in Ephesians chapter 1 this evening. And before we do, I'd like to pray for us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I do bow before you. We worship you. We glorify you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. We ask you to open our minds this evening to your word, to the truth, that we might understand but more than that, God, not just that we might understand and have a few more facts about Jesus and the gospel in our minds, but instead that we might understand and then apply the truth we learn, that we might think godly thoughts, speak godly words, act godly ways, that our lives might be conformed to the image of Christ, that we might be obedient. That's our prayer for you, to, for you tonight, Lord. Please have mercy on us. And for any in our listening audience tonight that don't know you, Lord, I pray that you'd open the eyes of the heart and allow them to understand that you are the Christ, that you did die for our sins, that you have taken our punishment, that we are saved through faith in you, saved from the wrath of God. You've, you've declared it by your resurrection that this is the truth. Lord, help us open the eyes of the heart to those who don't know. Please do that, Lord that they might come to know you as well. We give you glory. We ask you to glorify your name in this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen and Amen. Church, we're going to begin. And as we do so, let's do this. Let's think about how often we're told in the Bible that we're not okay. And you know, that's all right with me. And I, I assume as a follower of Jesus Christ, that's all right with you as well. We need to get God's opinion of us. We need to get it right. I mean, God in his word, he reveals who he is. Praise God. We learn about his character, his love, his power, his presence, 
his spirit okay beautiful but god also teaches us about who we are sometimes we don't want to hear that but there's a lot of negative things said about us and rightfully so we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god and sometimes i i know if you're reading like i'm reading it feels like wow this this passage is just hammering me we're, we're objects of god's wrath the judgment awaits us uh, man, what should we do? And a lot of passages lead us to understand ourselves from God's perspective. It's very helpful to understand that the wrath of God is coming. I'm not saying it's not. Or that judgment will be ours, and that's why we need to come to Christ as our Savior. But there are other passages in the Bible that just overwhelmingly declare the blessings God has bestowed upon the people who have come to him by faith. And Ephesians chapter 1 is such a passage. When you get to chapter 1, verse 3 in the book of Ephesians, you start the beginning of one sentence. From verse 3 all the way through verse 14, some 200 plus words, is one sentence in the Greek language. It's like Paul begins to think about blessing the Lord and praising God for the work he's done in salvation through Jesus Christ. And he just can't stop. It's just one thought pours in after the next, and he just keeps adding on to what he said. It's a beautiful, beautiful portion of Scripture. And as we begin to look at it tonight, I think first thing we'll do is review. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. I mean, this is just so profound if you unpack it. This is what we looked at last week. Do you remember? Paul is blessing the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what does he say? He says that God has blessed us. God has truly blessed us. There's no doubt about it. God's love has been poured out lavishly upon all who have come to Jesus Christ by faith. And in Christ, we are absolutely blessed, set apart for him, set apart for eternity, brought into his family. I can see why Paul gets so excited because these truths are so profound. He's blessed us in Christ Jesus. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. We talked about that last week. Do you remember that there's nothing you lack, dear one, beloved? There's nothing you lack. God has blessed you, if you're in Jesus Christ, with every spiritual blessing. You have his presence and his power and his love. You, you have his guidance. His spirit lives in you. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. We don't need to be asking the Lord for things he's already given us. He's given us tremendous blessing through his redemption. And as we just saw, he's blessed us in heavenly places. What an amazing truth to think that God himself has taken us in his heart already to be with him in heavenly places. We're blessed there. You say, I'm not in heaven. <laughs> I know, me neither. But when we were transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, our eternity with God began. We are in already there in God's mind. Remember, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day to the Lord. It, it's no time at all before we'll be in his presence glorified to spend eternity with him. Praise God. We're blessed not only here and now in this life as we go day by day, but we're blessed in heaven as well for all eternity. These verses are so rich. We get to that part in verse 4. He chose us in him. He chose us. Do you understand that your salvation is not random? It's not by accident. He chose us, every one of us. You want to think about having self-esteem problems or not feeling good about yourself. or If you're in Christ, guess what? How can we be depressed when we understand the reality that God's declaring here in Ephesians 1? What is there to be depressed about? We can have bad circumstances. I'm not saying sad things don't happen and that our hearts don't break from time to time. But that's emotional upheaval based on bad circumstance, right? In the end, the truth of our destiny is still in place no matter what bad circumstance befalls us here. 
And God has chosen us in him. I, I just can't get over that. He chose us. You are not a Christian by accident. You are not at this church by accident. You are not called to serve God with the giftings that you have by accident. None of it's happenstance or random. God chose all who have come to Jesus Christ in faith. He chose us. And just to blow our minds a little more, Paul adds to that at the end of verse 4. He chose us before the foundation of the world. Do you understand that God knows everything from eternity past to eternity future? God knows everything. There is no accident. There's never a surprise. God is fully aware of every circumstance and every detail of our lives. What did Jesus tell us? He has the number of hairs on our head numbered. I mean, he knows us. And he knew us before eternity or before the foundation of the world. He knew us from eternity past. In God's mind, it was foreordained by him that you would be here in this church serving him with your gifts right now as you follow Jesus Christ and surrender your life to him. What a mind-blowing thought. And, and this is just the beginning of this long section of Ephesians chapter 1, this sentence that goes from verse 3 to verse 14. This is the beginning of it. Let's just continue on in the passage. In verse 5, well, we're going to pick up that two-word, in love, uh, from the end of verse 4. But in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Every little phrase in this verse is worth consideration, and I, I hope you'll stay with me. It's out of God's love, right? God is motivated out of love for you, out of love for me, in love. This is what the Bible teaches us. God's work came about because of his love for us. And what did he do for us? He predestined us. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you look up the word predestined in the Greek, it's prorizo. And, and I don't know why you need to know that. I just thought you might be interested. But the word means to be, to limit in advance or to predetermine. Now get the point here. God chose you, but he predetermined. He predetermined, <coughs> excuse me, when you would be born. He predetermined what your gender would be. He predetermined where you were going to be born, who your parents were going to be, what situations you'd be born into. He predetermined his purpose for your life. He predetermined what your skills and talents would be. He predetermined that at some point in your life you would come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. He wants us in heaven in Christ. He wants us. And he has set things up to say, you are coming. I know you will come. I will offer you the invitation and you will come. Uh, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because so many people want to say, well, this is election and election's just not fair because if I, if God already knows I'm going to be with him forever, then what about it? Why do I have to go through all this uh, receiving Jesus? And, and isn't there a contradiction that God chooses some and doesn't choose others? Why, why is God doing that? Well, just understand it in the mind of God, his sovereign wisdom is overwhelmingly right all the time. And how can you balance out the fact that God has chosen you, and yet you have to participate with God and receive Christ and submit your life to him as a willful decision on your part? How is it that we play a role in coming to Christ while Christ plays a role in predestining us to be his? How do you balance that out? It's really simple. You say, well, in the mind of God, it makes sense. And that's how he's revealed it in his word. And I don't need to get stuck in it. I just need to believe that to God, that makes sense. Now, I have a sinful mind that's controlled by my sinful nature. I'm a fallen creature, just as you are. How would we expect to be understanding of the mind of God? And is he under obligation to explain election to us? Not at all, but just understand what a beautiful blessing it is to know 
that God has had us in mind from eternity past, from the foundation of the world. He knew we would come when offered the gift of salvation. The reason we need to continue to witness is we don't know who's going to come. We don't know who God has predestined or chosen. So we present the gospel to everyone that doesn't know Christ. Some will resist, some will persecute us for it, but others will receive and will come into the kingdom as God has chosen, as God has predestined. What an amazing truth, church. Just let that sink into you how much God loves you. He has brought you in his love to be his, predestined you. Another question we all need to ask ourselves is, are we using the gifts and talents God has given us? Are we uh, responding, I guess would be the word, to the Lord in the way that he has called us? He's gifted us. He's talented. He's given us talents. He's, he's brought us into this church body to serve him. Are we fulfilling our obligation to him as he's called us? You know, it's very interesting to see how some people approach church. They come to church when things get bad. They come to church when... There's a, a rough patch in their life, or they need the pastor's help. And how can this be? They're not serving the pastor. They're not serving um, anybody but God. God has called. God has predestined. God has chosen. God has brought the gifts and talents. God is the one that needs to be served. To deny that is to walk away from what God has chosen for us. Well, as verse 5 continues, he predestined us. And the next phrase is, for adoption as sons. And now that can be sons and daughters. Some of these translations uh, stick to a male gender when they describe these things. But God's not excluding women here or daughters. Uh, There's adoption for all who come to Jesus Christ by faith. So he's predestined us, but in love, he's also predestined us for adoption. Now, Think about the idea of adoption, church. What does that mean? Well, in modern day, an an orphan, somebody that doesn't have anybody to take care of them, somebody whose parents and support system are gone, they're the ones that get adopted, right? And what happens in adoption? You get brought into somebody's family, somebody that loves you, and somebody that's going to take care of you, nurture you, educate you, guide you, supply your needs, There's going to be a family relationship. What are we being told here? That God has not only predestined us to be with him, but he's brought us into his family. We have become part of his family. Look at this. In Jeremiah, just think about the ministry of the prophet Jeremiah. As the book begins, I want you to see this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Do you see that God understands why he's bringing Jeremiah into the world? Before you were born, before I formed you in the womb. In God's mind, Jeremiah had already been appointed to be a prophet from eternity past. This is how God looks at it. He predestines us. We're in his family. He's put a calling on us. Just think about that, church, for your life. Jeremiah is not exceptional. Well, he was an exceptional prophet. Sure, he followed God through the good times and the bad times, and he suffered for it, but he didn't waver. He followed God. Okay, but the same thing could be said for us. If we're coming to Jesus Christ by faith, what happens? We have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, follow him. We have to give him our lives. We want to walk with him as his slaves. We obey him. We we serve him. He's always known we were coming. He's always had a purpose for us. Your calling is not to sit on the couch and watch Netflix waiting for Jesus to come. That's not the calling God has on your life. God has predestined you to know him He has adopted you through Christ into his family, and he has a purpose for your life, just like he does for Jeremiah. Or or look at this. In Galatians, Paul is talking to the churches of Galatia, and he brings up the same point. Listen to this. But when he who had set me apart, who's that? That's the Lord. Before I was born. Wait a minute. You mean, Paul, you're telling us that you know in your heart through this 
idea of, of predestination and election being chosen by God. You knew that God had already set you apart to serve him before you were born? Wow. I mean, there it is right there. When he, who had, when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that there's his purpose, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone. In Galatians 1.15, and 16, Paul is modeling the fact that he was predestined. He was adopted into the family of God. He revealed his son to me for a purpose that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Now, you got to really sit back and look at that because if you remember the story of Paul, before he was Paul, he was Saul. And when he was Saul, what did he do? He persecuted the church mercilessly. He killed Christians. He imprisoned Christians. He was on his way to Damascus to hurt more Christians when Jesus knocked him to the ground and shone that bright light on him and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He revealed himself to Saul. Saul became Paul. Paul understood that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one. He surrendered his life and his whole life turned away from religion from keeping rules and trying to be good enough for God through your own self-righteousness. And Paul's whole direction in life was now to know Jesus Christ. Everything else was trash. You can read about it in Philippians 3. That's exactly what he says. In the end, even though Paul was so disobedient and so hurtful to members of the body of Christ, even though Paul was such a rascal when he was unconverted, Paul now says to the churches of Galatia that God had set me apart. God knew me even though I was so rebellious, I was so evil. Still, God got over all that and loved me enough to adopt me, to predestine me by his grace, to be his, to belong to his son, to preach him among the Gentiles, to serve him. What an awesome truth. And think about this, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now take note, church, take note. We're being told, me and you, that we've been adopted too. That it's not just for these high-powered biblical figures that do all these amazing ministries and write half the New Testament in Paul's case and all that. No, it's for anybody who comes to Jesus Christ, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You have a future life in Christ. Make no mistake about it. It's not just about suffering here. It's about being glorified with him forever. But on the other hand, you and I, each day of our lives, until Jesus comes or till he brings us to glory through our own death, we need to ask ourselves the question, am I serving the purpose that God has called me to serve? He's predestined me. He's chosen me. He's adopted me into his family. The least I can do is use every gift and talent he's blessed me with to serve him. That's the point. I mean, this is why it's so important to know these things. These are things that are good to know. Yeah, that's great. But the other thing these things do is they should motivate us to serve him well. They should also give us hope. They should also relieve us of any depression or, or upset about how our circumstances are going because these truths so overwhelm our circumstance. They're so much bigger than whatever might be happening to us in the here and now. And to just continue in verse 5, he says we're predestined for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. Now, this is a critical phrase in this verse. I, I want you to see this. Okay, he's predestined us. He's adopted us as his children out of his love for us. He's done it because of Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at a passage that's a little longer. It's in Titus. But I want you to read this with me and see it. Look at verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, 
passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. (laughs) What does that mean? That means you and I, when we were lost, we were really, really lost. We didn't have any love for God at all. We didn't have any desire to know God. We were just out there being evil and manifesting our evil and really bad behavior. Verse 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. What does that mean? That means when Jesus entered the world, when the goodness, that's God being good to us even though we don't deserve it. The loving kindness, that's God saying, I love you despite of your unsaved condition. I love you. Uh, Isn't this amazing that we're objects of wrath by nature in our sinful natures. God is going to judge sin. He's going to eliminate evil. If he eliminates evil, he's going to eliminate me. He's going to eliminate you too. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we're, we're subject to God's wrath. But in God's goodness, in God's loving kindness, he himself comes to the earth through Jesus Christ to save us from his wrath. But when he appeared, the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. Look at this, verse 5. He saved us. Oh, what? There's a sermon right there too, right? He saved us. This is what it means when it says, through Jesus Christ, we've been predestined. Through Jesus Christ, we've been adopted as sons. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places that he chose us. Through Jesus Christ, verse 5, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. That just simply points us to the idea that you and I can't earn this salvation. But according to his own mercy. It's because of the mercy of God. It's by his goodness and loving kindness through his mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that phrase at the end of verse 5? God has cleansed us. He's regenerated our souls. He's filled us with his spirit and renewed us so that on the day we stand before the judgment seat of God for his judgment, we will be declared righteous. Why? Is it because we've lived so well and we're so holy? Not in a physical, practical way. I mean, I'm not holy. Are you holy? Do you live perfectly? Nobody does. But because of the cross of Jesus Christ, Because we've put our faith in Jesus, he has taken our sin upon himself. He has put his righteousness on us. There's been a substitution. What does that mean? It means when you stand before God at judgment, you'll be deemed righteous because you're covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. By the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, listen, whom he poured out on us richly, Through Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ our Savior, we're saved from God. And Jesus Christ died on the cross to pour out the love of God on us, to have mercy on us, to bring us from darkness to light, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There it is. We're in the family. We've been adopted. We've been predestined. We've been chosen. We've been blessed in heavenly places with every spiritual blessing. You are adopted as his child. What a truth, church, through Jesus Christ. So back to the verse. Think about this. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's think about it for a minute. Okay, he's predestined us. He's adopted us as sons through uh, through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Do you know what that means? It means that God wanted to do it. It was his will. He had purpose in bringing us to himself. The church does not exist because some guy thought about it and said, well, maybe us as Christians, maybe we should have meetings together. (laughs) No, the church exists, the followers of Jesus Christ, the assembly of followers of Jesus Christ exists on this earth. You and I are in Christ today. Yes, he's predestined us. Yes, he's adopted us into his family. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing uh, in heavenly places. But what else? It all happened because he wanted to. 
he's fulfilling his purpose because it's his will. I don't think we give much credence to God's desire that these things are happening despite our disobedience because God wants them. Look at this verse, or this section, I should say, Isaiah 46. This is God declaring himself. Listen, remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. What does that mean? My purpose will happen, and I will accomplish all my purpose, he says. You see verse 11, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. God's will is absolutely in place, irrevocably, unchangeably, uh, and this is the same will by which he's called us. He's called us to be his. I mean, just think about the ramifications of that church. Just think about what it means that God has blessed us in heavenly places with every spiritual blessing. He's called us. He's chosen us. He's predestined us. He's adopted us into his family. What an amazing, amazing God we serve. You are so precious to God if you're in Christ. Now, on the other hand, if you're somebody that says, I'm not going to believe that Jesus stuff. I'm not going to follow Christ. I'm not going to submit my life. I'm self-sufficient. I live for myself. Well, then I just warn you, dear friend, <laughs> you're subject to the judgment of God. Because when God eliminates evil, your own idea of how good you are will not be enough to save you from your evil. You're only going to be redeemed if you give your life to Jesus Christ. That's why it says so clearly, there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved than the name of Jesus. Why? Because he's the one that absorbs the wrath of God. He takes it upon himself for our sin. There's a substitution made when we come to him by faith. He takes our sin upon himself. He puts his righteousness on us. That's why it's so critical that you come to Jesus Christ or you will face God's judgment and you will be condemned. Not, not because God doesn't want to save you, but because you refuse to come to him on his terms as he's revealed himself. He's revealed what he wants. He's revealed who we are. And he's made a way for us. What a tremendous truth. Well, let's just review verses 3 through 5. That's all we're going to get to tonight. <laughs> but that's good. Hold on to it. Think about it. Okay? He has blessed us in Christ Jesus. That you're in Christ now. What does it say? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You have been redeemed by faith in Jesus Christ. You're blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. God has lavishly showered us with his blessings. This isn't talking about, oh, he's going to get me a better car and a better house and I want to be blessed with the material things that I want. This is so much deeper than materialism. This is the blessing of God's presence. This is the blessing of God's love in our hearts, his spirit in our hearts, the blessings of an eternity with him where Houses and material things as we know them today won't matter at all. It'll all pass away. But we'll enter his kingdom and be glorified to live with him forevermore. These are the blessings that are spoken of in Ephesians 1. He chose us in him. He chose us. It's so incredible to understand. Just meditate on that church. Before the foundation of the world, God called you. And as we review, we're going to review verse 5 and remember that in love, God predestined us. He knew about you before time began. He wanted you in his kingdom before time began. You surrendered your life to him because he predestined you. Again, don't get hung up on election. It's one of the greatest truths there is to understand that God's love is extended to us to such a degree 
He predestined us for adoption. You are an heir of Jesus Christ if you've come to him by faith. That means you're entitled to all the blessings he has, all the riches he has. You're an heir. You're an heir. This is why our service to him is so uh, compelling. We have to get on our knees before him, pray, walk with him, love him, serve him, live for him, obey him at every opportunity because of all that he's done for us through Jesus Christ. This is why we worship the Savior so fervently because we know that he has paid the price to bring us into the kingdom of light, to the kingdom that God has for us. It's through him and it's according to his purpose. God not only has done all these things, God wants you. God wants me. God has determined in the purpose of his will that we would belong to him. Listen to this as we close tonight. 1 John 3, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. God has lavished his love on you, church. God has lavished his love on all who come to Jesus Christ by faith. It's such an amazing truth. It's such an uplifting, empowering, uh, building us up, edifying us as we think about what God has done. I hope you're considering the truth of Scripture to be superseding the truth of what you might be telling yourself about who you are. Many of us are filled with negative thoughts. I mean, you don't have to beat me up. I can beat myself up better than any of you. Do you have that in your life as well? Are you a person that can just destroy yourself as you think negatively about yourself? The Bible says, hey, when you come to Jesus Christ by faith, old things pass away. Everything is new. You're a new creation in Christ. And now what do you do? You look at what God says is true about you and you say, that's true about me. My negative thoughts of how bad I am and blah, 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 that's been overcome. I've been predestined. I've been chosen by God. I've been brought into the kingdom of life through Jesus Christ. I will live forever with him as a child of God adopted into his family, as an heir. He knew about me before the foundation of the world, and he loves me. What can I do but lay my life down before him and serve him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength out of love and gratitude? Don't let those negative thoughts overwhelm you, church. Don't listen. Listen to what God says about you. Yes, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, we fail God every day. It's not that any of us live perfectly. But nonetheless, it is the case that God has overcome every failure. God has paid the price for every sin. God, according to his purpose and his will, will establish us. He won't lose any of us. And we'll be with him for eternity through faith in Jesus Christ. Serve him well tonight. I pray that you just meditate on these things and rejoice. God bless you, church. Lord, we give you glory.